What has happened to all of the wild men in the church? We have come to believe the lie that meekness is weakness. Join me today with my guest Ryan Miller as we discuss how Jesus is looking for wild men that he can leverage to change the world as he directs them. Our guest today is Ryan Miller. Ryan lives in San Diego with his beautiful wife of eight years. Ryan is the founder of Share Your Struggles Digital Counseling Service and has over 654,000 followers on Instagram where he posts amazing content for believers. Check him out at Dude With Good News. Hey guys, I'm excited to have Ryan on today. Ryan, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show. We're excited to have you on here today. Man, what an honor. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have been binging your uh, Instagram videos, and you've got a massive, I think you're at 654,000 followers, and just really enjoying your content. And as I was listening to you, I thought, man, this guy sounds like a younger version of me, and much better looking than me, of course. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, I appreciate what you're doing, man, and just your unapologetic passion for Jesus. Mm, thank you. Yeah. That's the best compliment I could get. Hey, That's, that's awesome. been a been a long journey to get there so I'm, I'm i'm really grateful to hear that well i want to hear about that journey man i don't know uh much about you besides your videos let's dive into your story talk, talk to us about your journey yeah so uh, yeah it's, it's interesting you know I, I kind of started social media on accident and so you know the lord's really blessed that platform and it's cool to be able to see how many people get reached but it's also a little weird yeah to be like man i don't i don't know these people and in fact, I don't even have social media. Like I, I farm it all out. I, I film videos in my car, or upstairs in my office. And then I've got a lady that posts it just because I don't want to be on it. It's, yeah. it's a time waster. And, and uh, you know, I used to battle pornography addiction pretty heavily. And so I'm like, I don't want to see half naked chicks. Like, you know, so uh, I'd rather just not be on it. But, you know, it's interesting. The Lord has now given me what I always wanted, which was a platform. But in order to get there, I felt like the Lord had to strip everything. Wow. And so that's, that's the, you know, in his mercy, I think he has developed meekness um, in me. And that's not a brag because anyone who, who knows the process of becoming meek, it's, it's, it's suffering, it's submission, it's surrender. And uh, he's, he did that in me over, over the course of many years. And so it's an honor to be able to then partner with him and ask him, what do you want me to say and commune with him first before I communicate um, but yeah, it's been pretty cool to see what the Lord's done. And there's so many stories that have come from it that, you know, God always cares more about the one than he cares about the 99, right? So yeah. it's always really cool to see uh, the DMs that come through or, you know, just the stories that come out of it. Yeah, we actually uh, post hero stories. Whenever we get a life transformation story, we actually have a whole <laughs> running file. We share it on our podcast. We actually shared one on this episode. And uh, it's all about that, man. It's all about a life being changed. But, you know, it's really interesting. I just have a, I wrote a book called Dialed In. It's coming out on September 3rd. And I wrote a, ch a chapter on serving. And, you know, it's you, mm -hmm. you talk about meekness. For some reason, you know, meekness is a word you don't hear outside the church. But those mm -hmm. outside the church, when they hear it, they think weakness. But that mm -hmm. couldn't be further from the truth. Can you talk to us about what you know? In fact, I, I'm setting this up because I've watched a video of yours on meekness. Can you talk oh, to us really? about okay. yeah, what biblical meekness is and why it's the opposite of weakness? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's such a paradox. Yeah. So the Lord, the Lord taught me meekness, um, gosh, man, through so much death. Meekness, meekness is, is death in a sense. Um, so the Lord, the Lord had to teach me meekness because this is embarrassing to admit, but I, I wanted to be Christian famous for so long. Yeah. Like I was a pastor at a church and the church was always a little bit weird to me because you get together with, you know, these other professional Christians and you plan out a Sunday morning, which is essentially a rock show, right? Yeah. You're planning out, you know, the, the worship, the announcements, the sermon, the worship, and then people leave. And that's not the dog church in general, I don't want to speak against Christ's bride, but there's a certain structure that's been created. And so I idolized the stage for so long, you know, being kind of like this associate pastor and wanting that stage. And so um, to not go super long winded, basically what happened was I, I had these two things happening where I was, there was this deep idolatry in my heart that came from woundedness. I grew up in this very, very successful family. 
Um, I am the only person of all of my cousins, all of my brothers, so everyone in my generation that does not have a PhD. Wow. And we're talking big dogs. We're talking, you know, the top brain surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. My brother just got listed as a top 40 scientist under 40 in the world. My other brother oh my is God. like Mensa level genius. And they're all not believers. I'm the only Christian in the group. But growing up, seeing all this success, it caused me to start striving yeah, and to start trying to prove myself and, and my worth. And the Lord just had to just start chopping. Um, because the more I leaned into him, um, when I would put my identity in the things I did, uh, I would, in his mercy, he would lead me towards uh, embarrassment and failure. And that happened in this. I mean, there's so many stories that could come from this. The biggest one was I wanted to create a, a, a movie where I would take these four boys out of gangs, prison, foster care addiction, and pair them with wild Mustangs to tame and train over uh, two months. And it seemed like the Lord was bringing this whole thing together. And he was, you know, Oscar award winners started coming on board, Emmy award winners. Now we're able to raise millions of dollars and make this thing happen. And the reason you haven't heard of this, this movie or now it's a series is because it's not out yet. We filmed this thing in 2018 and we brought it out to Hollywood and started getting million dollar offers and the Lord had to fully kill it. And in that process, I had to go back to investors and I had to tell them that the Lord had given me and my wife dreams and visions to pull this thing from Hollywood. Wow. And, um, you know, we're, we're hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt Yeah. and I'm having to in faith because I'm hearing so clearly from the Lord now pull this thing. And eventually the Lord started sending us checks, like literally like tax incentives from the state of Alabama where we did post-production where all of a sudden, like within a day we have no debt. And like, so the obedience led to that, you know, not being debt free, but the next thing that happened was the disappointment mm. and all of these people that I wanted their approval. And I, everyone thought I was going to be a big deal, right? Everyone's like, Oh my gosh, he's doing it. He's 28 years old. And he's now the executive producer of this show. Like Ryan is the man, my wife's grandpa who, who gave a million bucks to the, to the show. He literally was telling me I'm going to, he thinks I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. And now I'm getting phone calls from him and other people saying you failed our money. And I just remember wanting to crawl into a hole and die. I stopped shaving. I stopped like taking care of myself in many ways, just because my biggest idol was now crushed, which was a claim. My idol was a claim. It was not necessarily, um, you know, money. I didn't, I've never really cared about money. It's always just doing something noteworthy and having the people closest to me be like, wow, wow. He really did it. Didn't he? <clears throat> and the Lord had to kill it all. And in that moment, um, I had I had now written a book because you know I'm now like before like the marketing and distribution agency that's done Frozen to Hunger Games is now backing us. And so we've got this like all star team, and we pull this thing from Hollywood. And in the process of like when we thought it was going to be successful, this guy's telling me like, "Hey, you got this hit. You got to start writing a book now." So now I've got Bob Goff's book agent. Now I'm like, this everything looks like it's just going to explode, and the whole thing just crumbles. And there's so many details I'm leaving out because it would take forever. Um, but I'd written this book. It was a really crappy book, you know. But a hundred thousand <laughs> words written in the Google Doc. I didn't know what I was talking about. But the name of the book was Taming Mustangs. And it was talking about a lot of the wild men in the Bible. And it was talking about a lot of my experience on the ranch. And eventually, like in the process of just losing everything, it seemed like I had to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, what is this book? Now that everything else has died, do you still want me to write this book? And I didn't hear anything. So I just shut my laptop and I said, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick this book up again until you tell me what it's about. Mm. And the Lord started whispering the word meekness to me. Mm which I thought was so boring. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm like, that is not a bestseller. No. Like if you want to write a bestseller, you don't write about meekness. So I just kept hearing this when I was praying, I kept hearing the word meekness. And I had already had a chapter in the book on meekness. I called it the meekness paradox where meekness isn't weakness. It's power and humility in one. And that's, you know, that's an okay definition, but the Lord started really uncovering to me what meekness is. And I started looking up because I kept hearing it in prayer. I started looking up every verse on meekness. I started looking up what the Greek meaning was on meekness. And, you know, so I pull up a Greek lexicon. I'm just on my computer. My wife's upstairs and I about fall off the couch because I pull up the word meekness means prowess, which means to tame a wild mustache. Yep. Yep. 
And uh, man, I knew what that meant because yeah. I had just gone through months and months and months of watching Mustangs being tamed. And so I now I had this context, I had this picture that few people on the planet have this window into this, this, uh, what I believe is the picture of masculinity, which is meekness because I'd watched it externally and I had felt it internally, which what happens is with that word meekness, uh, back, the Greeks understood the context for this word. Cause they, in order to, 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 to cultivate these wild horse or to be cultivate these war horses, they go and find wild horses in the mountains and they take these wild horses and they would, they would meek them. They would, they would, they would, uh, tame them into these war horses. And that process was painful for the horse because this horse had to go from being this autonomous, um, scarcity minded horse, always being, you know, so hyper vigilant about predators, you know, they're prey animals. Horses are prey animals. They have eyes on the side of their head, constantly scanning for predators. And so how do you take this thing, put it into a round pen where it instinctually knows you're a predator and then get that thing to trust you. Mm. That's the question, right? Wow. So you, I, I've done it before. You take this this prey animal, thousand pound prey animal, scared to death, able to kill you with the hoof, and you put it in a round pen where it's trapped. And the first step of getting meek, uh, getting this horse to become meek is called acknowledgement, where you pursue this wild mustang around this round pen, and it's going buck wild. It's kicking, bucking, snorting. The dust is is kicking up. And just this mayhem in this round pen, but the the trainer says, just keep pursuing it, keep pursuing it. And the moment that horse gets curious and just stops for a second and looks at you, you completely relax your posture. You, you relax your shoulders and you walk away from the horse. You give it what it wants. You, it wants you to get the heck away from it. And so this horse starts to learn, huh? The way I get this thing that I think is going to kill me to get away from me is I just look at it. And so over and over and over again, it starts looking at you. It just gets curious. And then the craziest thing happens after a couple of days, this thing starts to follow you. And it's as you pursue this horse, it's still freaking out. But the moment it acknowledges you and you walk away, you release the pressure, it's called, this thing starts to follow you. And then slowly you get close enough where you can touch it. And these are horses, right? They've never experienced a hand petting them before. And so it's like the best feeling in the world for them. They've never experienced that relationship, that intimacy, that touch before. Mm. And, and soon this thing goes from being scared to death of you, about to kill you, to being the most loyal horse out there. And the whole time that I'm looking at this definition of meekness, I have this grid in my mind. Like I said, of my own heart running away from the Lord, trying to do my own thing, trying to be successful on my own, looking for acclaim in all the wrong places, medicating myself with pornography and drinking because I wasn't filled up in my heart. Even though I'm a pastor, you know, looking at porn on Saturday, Mm -hmm. walking into the church on a Sunday morning while I'm still married, you know, all these things to try to medicate my heart. And the whole time the answer was in meekness. It's in simply acknowledging the kindness of my master. And then because of his kindness, which leads us to repentance, according to Romans chapter two, verse four, Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you begin to follow. And then you experience a touch of the Holy Spirit and your life changes. And that's meekness. Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is a complete, utter loss of your life. It's surrender. It's found in saying, I no longer am going to be the master of my life. I'm actually going to give the reins. I'm going to give my back. You can get on my back. And I'm going to be so in tune with you that with one nudge of the reins, I'm going to go where you tell me to go. And I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to anticipate where you want me to go. And then slowly you can get out of the round pen. You can go on some trail rides. And eventually the Lord will take you to war. But he'll only take you to war if you're meek enough to completely reject the self completely reject everything that you once found valuable and to say, I'll go wherever you call me to go. And that's what the world's missing. That's why the world's broken. It's because we don't have enough men that are willing to answer the call and to surrender their entire lives and to say, how do I become a slave of Christ? There is so much there. You said that that horse, that wild stallion gives you its back. You know, in MMA, we would call that a rear naked choke. You're completely Mm -hmm. vulnerable. You're completely open to whatever that person wants to do at that point. And you have to submit, right? So, mm. so here, so here's. I want to go back. You, 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 you use the word meekness in a sentence the way I've never heard you anyone use it before. You said we meeked that horse. Mm. Did I hear you say that right? Yeah. Okay, we yep, meeked yep. the horse. So another definition we could say in the secular world is we broke the horse. Yes. We broke we, yes. that horse. We need to break that horse. We need to meek that horse. How is meeking 
similar to breaking? Well, they're different. Yeah. So I'll never forget my, my mentor in college. He was the football coach at Wheaton College, a guy named Mike Swider. And I remember I would hear people talk about the way he parented his kids. And they're like, dude, those kids are going to go off the deep end. He's so hard on them. And I brought it up to him one time. I'm like, dude, you know, I keep hearing these whispers about all these things you force your kids to do. You know, they have to get straight A's. They have to show up to class on time or else there's consequences. They have to get up and rope climb and run a mile and all these things. And he stopped me and he goes, Ryan, you know where they're all wrong? You know why my kids will never rebel? Because rules without relationship equals rebellion. Yep. So why kids rebel against parents. It's why countries rebel against dictators. But rules with relationship equals a response. Yes. It's why my players will run through a brick wall for me. And that's the difference between breaking a horse and making a horse. It's what the church doesn't understand right now. It's why men are leaving the church is because God in his mercy has chosen to call himself a father. And he has chosen to hold us men to a high standard where we're called to lead. And every single man knows that in their heart. And we will run through a brick wall for any person that we see holding us to a high standard where we don't question their love for us. If we know how far they're willing to go for us, we will go to the ends of the earth for them. That's why the fog machines, it's why she's sitting in rows at church. All of that has been built for women and children. If I'm oh, being completely hundred percent, a hundred percent, hundred percent. It's all, it's, it's, it's capitalistic. It's how do we fill butts in the seats? Yep. So many churches today. And again, I'm not trying to dog the bride of Christ. I'm trying to dog the structure of the bride of Christ. Yes. I'm trying to say that her pants are all backwards right now. All of, all of that has been built to, to, uh, to attract more. When Jesus says, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and people go, ugh, and they leave. So the difference between making a horse and breaking a horse is relationship. If you don't know what to do with something that's a little too wild, you cage it. Right now, there are over 70,000 wild Mustangs sitting behind bars and holding facilities all across America. People don't know that. Wild Mustangs are federally protected, right? So you can't eat them, you can't kill them, but they're doubling in population every four years because wildness, it, it replicates, mm -hmm. it reproduces, mm -hmm. right? We're all attracted to it. There's something about that, the wild mustang we're attracted to. But if you don't know what to do with it, if it's a little bit too out there, what do you do? You try to stifle it, you try to cage it. And so a lot of horse trainers, what they would do is out of fear, out of scarcity mindedness, not seeing what that horse could become, not seeing what that boy in prison could become, not seeing what that third grader with ADHD could become. What you do is you create so much structure and you just try to prevent it from, from, from making mistakes. You coddle it. You, 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 you put bars around it instead of aiming the Mustang, meeking the Mustang, which is to say, Hey, why don't we yoke up together? Right? What did Jesus say? He said, take my yoke upon mm -hmm. you and learn from me. Mm -hmm. So that's a work tool. You're attaching yourself to the Lord and he's saying, I'm the stronger oxen. I'm the stronger Mustang. I'm going to show you how to step it out. And Jesus went out and he found men that were just wild enough to answer the call. And then like James and John, they get so pissed off at the Samaritans that they're like, why don't we just rain down fire and kill everyone? <laughs> and notice what Jesus does. He doesn't, he doesn't squash that. He sure he rebukes them. He corrects yeah. them. But then what does he, what does he call them? The sons, sons of, of thunder, thunder, baby. Let's go, dude. That's it. That's it. And and that that is what I think the message needs to be, especially to Christian men, is you have such a mantle that God has called you to that you like no matter what people are going to tell you, no matter what you've been told your whole life, no matter what you felt from people about the, the parameters put around your life, God has called you to something significant and something special. And I think, I think a lot of men are believing the lie that they can't squeeze every drop of juice from their life. And they can. Yep. But it's found in relationship with Jesus. 100%. It's found in intimacy. It's found in getting up every single morning and say, saying, Lord, what are you up to today? And how can I help? And you become a slave of Christ. Mm -hmm. and you, you get home from work and you check on your wife's heart. And you're that in tune that, that John, John, who was called the son of thunder, eventually become John the beloved who would lay his head on Jesus's lap. He's that tender, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That's what meekness is, is you're willing to go to war. You're willing to be beheaded for the gospel, but you're so in love with your master that with one nudge of the range, you'll go to war. And with, with one, you know, with one uh, relaxing posture, you'll lean your head on his chest. 
that's then that's that's fulfillment that's that's what that's it right there that's successful living hundred well you know it's really funny I've always defined meekness as a stallion in the stalls waiting to run but he's bridled it's a bridled yeah. stallion it's strength under control and 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 yeah. it's really interesting because you talked about Jesus in a um, was it John chapter six when he said eat my flesh and drink my blood I can't remember what I think that's John chapter six you know Jesus did not give a rip about fans. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, you yeah. talked about the fog machines and the rock star, you know, model. <clears throat> that that's a fan. Get them in the seats. It's it, it's a very good model at growing a church without Jesus. You, you have mm-hmm. there's a recipe to grow the church without Jesus. But Jesus wants followers, not fans. He wants guys mm-hmm. to say, "Hey, I know you're a wild stallion, stallion, but if you just let me get on top here and mm-hmm. direct your life, you know what what does the Bible say in Isaiah 5, 20? 3021, whether you turn to the left or right, you will hear a voice behind you that could be behind you and on top of you, riding you like a you know, a <coughs> jockey saying, mm-hmm. this is the way, walk in it. And I think yep. that's so good, man. That's so powerful. So so go, let's go back to, so you talk about wild men uh, uh, under uh, the Lord's control, surrendered. What It seems like we're taking these wild stallions and our culture is trying to create geldings. Why do you think that is? Yep. Well, you don't know what to do with something that's a little bit wild. You cage it. Yeah. It's human nature, right? Um, I think it's very, very hard to see the value in something that's unrefined. Oh. Um, why, why do you think that the most popular shows on um, A&E and all those shows are fixer-upper shows? You know? It's, it's because you want to see something transformed. There's something in each of us that longs for transformation. And in our sinfulness, in our short-mindedness, in our microwave generation, we, we just want quick fixes. We just want quick solves. But you can't put a timeline on someone's change, right? There are, there are people in, you know, I'll speak directly to the listener. There are people in your families right now that it might seem utterly hopeless, but you have to remember who Jesus chose. You have to remember Matthew chapter one, the, the, the passage that gets skipped most in the New Testament is the genealogy of Jesus that is filled with some of the worst sinners out there. It's filled with people. Like how in the world, and, and genealogies, we don't really understand the importance of that, but I mean, it's like your LinkedIn profile. I mean, it's like, like what you're putting out there for the world. It's, it is everything. It means so much, or it meant so much to people in that culture, where you came from, your family line. And Jesus is flipping the script and he's bragging on redemption. He's not, he's not ashamed of your past and he's not scared of what needs to take place in order to get someone from A to B. And so, um, you know, Jesus says that we can ask anything in his name and it'll be done. And so I think it's the call to the Christian to be the most open-minded people when it comes to people's change and to say, um, listen, the Lord can do anything. And, and, and this actually isn't, I think a lot of people, they'll, you know, I've dealt with a lot of addicts and you get to the point where you're exhausted, right? Um, and they don't have boundaries enough to know that their job is to simply step it out and to be faithful to turn over the responsibility of that person's life to Jesus. And they're not responsible. They're, you know, uh, like it says in Galatians six, it says, bear one another's burdens and you fulfill the law of Christ. And then three verses later, it says, but each ought to bear their own load. To bear one another's burden is to, to empathize. To bear one another's load is to take responsibility for that person. So all we're called to do is we're called to see the value in people. We're called to empathize with all people. You're not responsible for someone's change. And when you get to that point where you can relinquish the control, when you have the meekness to say, actually, I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. And so is he, so is she, so is my son, so is my daughter, so is my mom or my dad who didn't raise me the right way. And I've got all this bitterness. And yet I'm called as a Christian to forgive and believe the best. It's a, it's simply a matter of saying, Lord, I turn them over to you and I wish them the best. And and when you do that, that's like the bedrock. When you do that, then you're able to see people as Jesus says. Because ultimately, you're not scarcity-minded because the, the weight's on your shoulders. The weight's not on your shoulders. Yeah, it's interesting. He chose uh, in his uh, lineage, his genealogy, a prostitute, murderers, 
adulterers. I mean, you know, the, the one of the I did a series on our podcast here about two years ago where I talked about why the Bible is true, why the Bible, why I know unequivocally the Bible is true. And one of the things that I believe about the Bible, the Bible is the only book in the history of the world that highlights and accentuates and almost brags about the flaws of its heroes. Like, why would yeah. the Bible do that? If you're going to have heroes, make your heroes perfect, but the rooster crows. Yeah. Make your heroes perfect, but then, you know, instead of going to Nineveh 500 miles up, I go to Tarshish 2,500 miles out and outside of the Mediterranean, out to the Atlantic Sea. You know, the Bible mm -hmm. highlights the flaws, and do you think that is because God is interesting in taming wild, meeking wild stallions? Is he trying to tell us something here? Why do you think this oh is? Oh, my gosh. Dude, you look at who he gets mad at. Yeah. Just look at the Bible. Yeah. Who does Jesus get mad at? The religious leaders. It's, it's the religious leaders. <laughs> yeah. It's so clear. Jesus would rather tame a Mustang than inspire a mule. And you have all these mules in these religious circles, you know, all these mules trying to, you know, these whitewashed tombs trying to look really good on the, the outside. That's what I think authentic men can't stand about Christianity is you look at these dudes and you're just like, do I want to be like that? And then I contrast that with what I see in the scriptures. I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, you've got David who struggles like me with lust, who looks at that woman's or that, that man's wife, gets her pregnant, kills off the dude, and then has the humility to come back to the Lord and say, create me a pure heart and a right spirit within me. And the reason he's a man after God's own heart is not because of the sin. It's because of the repentance. It's because of the purity of heart. And the wildness, this is a dude who killed so many people in battle, he couldn't build the temple. And yet he's out singing and dancing naked, praising his God. And people are like, what is wrong with the king? And his response, I'll be even more embarrassed than this. Yes. You think this is all I got? Like, you have no idea how madly in love with Jesus I am. And right now, I was actually, I, I, uh, I just started a podcast and I had this guy on the podcast the other day who's gay and he's fully like given up that lifestyle and followed Jesus. That's rad. And, and he's like, and I, I'm telling him, I'm like, dude, you're like, like hero territory for me. For you sure. Hero territory. For sure. And, and he's like, dude, you, you, like he said something that like almost it, like I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. I don't even know what I think about it, but it's so weird. He's like, you know, like I long romantically for a man still, but I've given that up on the altar. And he's like, the Lord has taken the place of that. And I understand what it means to be the bride of Christ. And I was like, I was like trying to remove the sexual from it because, you know, that's a little weird. You know? yeah. But at the same time, I haven't been able to think, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it because what it causes me to think is like, that makes sense why women have such an easier time relating to Christ in this deep, intimate, like emotional way. And I, feel like I struggle and I'm trying not to, I'm trying to like fall madly in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there are so many men that would even struggle to say I'm madly in love with Jesus because it feels weird. It feels a little gay, you know, if I'm just be <laughs> speaking totally, frankly. but the reality is that's the goal of the Christian life is to fall madly in love with Jesus to like David. David was a badass dude. David was a freaking badass. And at the same time, he's so madly in love with the Lord that he's singing and dancing. Can you imagine that? Like I just walk outside, I start singing and dancing and like, just like worship songs. People are like, this guy's a loony tune, but he didn't care. And that's what I'm trying to get to. That's the meekness. That's the paradox of meekness that you can be so tough, so hardened because you've been tested and trained through the, through the wilderness. And then in the round pen, you've given your heart to your master. And then you say at the same time, I'll lay, lay my head on your chest. I'll sing and dance. I'll be even more embarrassed as, than this. And then I'll answer the call when the bell rings and I'll go to war. That's meekness. Well, you know, it's funny. My wife uh, hates this movie, but I love this movie. I love the avatars. I, be, yeah. And I love the scene where he 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 meeks that the flying dragon. And yeah. and there's a connection. They let, They make an actual connection. And people badmouth yeah. the show for being this anti-Christ thing. But I thought, man, that is the connection that we want to have with Jesus. We want to have yeah. a connection where we're saying, hey, I will go wherever you want because I'm constantly connected to you. And and because of that, yeah. I'm going to submit. And here's the thing that bothers me uh, in the church, Big C Church, is that there seems, you know, if you look at Islam, and I'm not a fan of Islam, but if you look at Islam, the more religious you are, 
the more of a man you're seen as being. Mm, mm -hmm. The more vigilant, the more the more committed. But in Christianity, the more committed you are to Jesus, the less of a man you are uh, seen as. Yeah. And it's really, and I don't know where that picture's come from. I think that Satan has um, planted spies within the church. Uh, I think mm. some of them are pastors, some of them are theological professors. I think some of them are uh, worship leaders, and we've we've bought this hook, line, and sinker. But the the reality of it is, is like you're saying, is the man who is meek, who's under complete control of the master, he's more of a man than he ever will be. That's the message. You are more of a man than you could ever be without Jesus, because yeah. he's the one that made you. He's the one that built the yoke. Have you heard the Have you heard the legend about Jesus, the yoke maker? Have you heard the story? So there's a legend in William Barclay's commentaries right there uh, when he talks about Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, he talks about, uh, no, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Uh, my yoke is easy. You mentioned that earlier yeah. that, you know, we know Jesus was a carpenter, but people, some people, legend says that he was a yoke maker. And then, wow. you know, you market your, your, your business and behind his shop, he had a sign, my yoke is easy. In other words, I'm, it's so balanced, it's so perfect that when you put this on, so there's like a legend out there, and that's what guys yeah. need to realize is that you will never be the man that God has called you to be without radical devotion to Jesus directing your life. I, why do you think this is so hard for guys in the church today? You know, we often forget, guys, that God has called us to steward the bodies he gave us so that we'll be ready, healthy, and spiritually dangerous to fight the good fight. That's why we're so excited to partner with Mountain Tough Fitness Lab. Join me on my journey by going to mountaintough.com and getting your free six-week trial when you type in the code ARENA30. You won't be disappointed. Stay dangerous. Why do you think this is so hard for guys in the church today? Gosh, man. Well, okay. So I'll, I'll bring it back to a story. So, uh, when the Lord was teaching me meekness, um, I just, I, I just wanted to soak it up for myself personally. And my first thought was how do I find men who are meek? Like I, I went on like almost this mission. I want to find the meekest men on the planet. And so I hit up my buddy who, uh, Todd, who knows everybody. He's just, he is probably the most interesting man in the world. And he's done a lot of stuff in government. He's done a lot. He's just, just fascinating dude. And uh, he introduced me to this guy named, uh, well, I probably shouldn't name him. So he, <laughs> he's in a, a three-letter agency and former special forces. And the dude was explaining to me, he's like, you think Navy SEALs are tough? He's like, wait till you know they get out of the teams and then they go in, into the CIA. And then, and then they drop you in a in a country and they just say, good luck. Like you're there, you're it. Like, that's it. You're the, you're the only person you don't have, you know, the Marines coming in after you. And he said, there was this mission he had back in the early nineties where uh, the U S government was actually training the Taliban to fight against the Russians. And so he's training these Taliban fighters. And he said, he could not for the life of them, get him to listen to them as these helicopters are buzzing these russian helicopters are buzzing they would pop out just in the open and start firing shots at these helicopters and he's like dude get behind a rock something what are you guys doing and he just couldn't get them to do it for the life of them and he said the holy spirit tapped him on the shoulder in that moment and he said these men have lost their life more than you have whoa for a god that's not even real whoa and so he said to me, he said, Ryan, you keep talking about meekness. You keep talking about it and you keep using the word surrender. That meekness is surrender. He said, I think there's actually a better word for it, ownership, where you have lost complete ownership of your lives. These men, these Taliban fighters had fully lost their lives. They had so much faith that they were going to go to heaven. If they were killed, they were going to have their virgins. They were, you know, whatever the whole nine yards. And they believed that in faith so much that they were willing to just stand out in open territory and just fire off shots at a helicopter firing down on them. And, and he said he, he, at that moment, he changed his whole faith changed. He had completely renewed perspective. And I think the reason why we don't see men like that is because we've been peddling fool's gold. And men can no longer recognize the real from the synthetic. Um, you know, I, I, coming back to, to talking about porn, you know, I mentioned earlier that I struggled with porn for a long time. It's, this is kind of a good 
um, an uh, anecdote for um, a struggle with pornography. Back in the early 1900s, there were these gypsy mobs that were wiping out forests all across the East Coast. And just like literally these the invasive mobs were just like eating trees and nobody knew what to do about it. And so the government hired a bunch of scientists to figure out like, how do we kill off these mobs? And they tried everything until one scientist got clever and he said, why don't we just replicate the female pheromone and let's just like spray that pheromone all across these forests. So they put the, the pheromone in these pellets. They just started like firing these pellets all across these forests. And these mobs just went crazy attacking these pellets, just like couldn't get enough of this fake female moth pheromone. And soon what happened was they could no longer recognize the real from the synthetic. And they stopped mating and the whole population died off. And the reason I think why we have so many men in this country that don't understand proper meekness that don't understand what a complete lost life is, is because we've been peddling the synthetic. We've been telling men that you can live this mediocre life, this mediocre faith where you just kind of do all the stuff, right? You do the whole song and dance and the church thing. That's kind of just kind of for your wife to lead. And, you know, you can kind of have this faith that, you know, you, you play pickleball on Thursdays, you have softball on Saturdays, you've got three kids, a dog, a wife, and you go to church on Sundays. And that's not what it is. It's if you actually believe what Jesus said, he's like, why don't you count the cost? Mm -hmm. And then why don't you pick up your cross? Mm -hmm. What did the cross do? It killed you. Pick up your cross and follow me. And then you'll be worthy to be called my disciple. So not everyone should be Christians. No. There's a lot of men listening to this. You should just don't be a Christian. Exactly. You either hot, hot or cold. But if you want to answer the call, if you're actually going to say, hey, I, I will lose my life. I will give my master the reins and I will give him my back. And I'm going to take the time it takes to be in the round pen and then go on the rides outside the round pen. Also that I can go to war. The Lord will send you on an adventure that you never could have possibly imagined. You know, it's really interesting. And that's, that's a bit of my life right now is just experiencing some of that adventure. Well, part of that synthetic Christianity, it's low cost Christianity, right? Hey, it's going to cost you Sunday. It's going to cost you an hour a week. That's all you got to do. Boost our attendance. I had a discussion with a, a friend of mine. He's a far right wing uh, conservative guy. And he's talking about, Hey man, I've got, I'm accumulate. I'm a gun guy. I'm a hunter. You know, and he's like, I'm accumulating guns because if the government comes at me, we're going to go to war. And I said, well, well, it depends on why they come at you. If they come at you for your faith, what the great honor is to die for your faith. He's like, whoa, whoa, no, no. Maybe the church used to be like that. I'm like, hold on, bro. That is biblical yeah, yeah, yeah. Christianity, like 2 Timothy yeah. 3.12. The godly in Christ will be persecuted. This is going to cost you. I, I believe this, Ryan. I don't know. I believe that God has given every man a hill to die on. Blessed is the man who discovers his, right? And and, mm -hmm. and the, the hill to die on is Jesus. Like, Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So if That's we good. aren't willing to lay down our lives, like literally, like like die for this stuff, and I think this is part of that synthetic Christianity, is that we see guys preaching on the radio and Sirius XM, and these guys are living in $20 million homes. We're like, man, that's interesting because nothing about what you're saying is how Jesus lived his life. Jesus mm -hmm. said in Luke nine, foxes have holes and uh, you know uh, dens and and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So we're, yeah. we're peddling this Christianity that is Americanized. You know what I mean? Yeah, and hundred percent. And I think a lot of men are like, yes, like we want that. But the reality is, the majority of us. I mean, things are getting pretty weird. But the majority of us probably won't be martyred for our faith. For sure. So how do you lay down your life? It starts with your wives. Yeah. It's, instead of laying down your life for your wife or like in some heroic act where you like save her from a bus. Yes. Which probably will never happen to yep. you. Why don't you lay down your tone when you get home from work? Why don't you lay down the fact that you're exhausted and the dishes are piling up and you just want to watch baseball? I'm speaking, I'm preaching myself here because I'm thinking about last night. And, <laughs> uh, and you know that she's exhausted because she has three screaming babies all day. And what you need to do is you need to do those dang dishes and then check on her heart. That is surrender. That is practical surrender. And then it sure it's evangelizing. Sure. It's sharing the gospel. Sure. It's, 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 uh, you know, uh, sticking up for things that are right in the world, even when you get hate for it, it's having moral courage. Um, but it's also very practically getting down on your kid's level, turning off your phone, looking at your wife in the eyes and, and, and attuning emotionally to her. And that's where I think the majority of men need to learn to surrender. Um, oh, for, well, our, our relationship with Jesus flows out of our relationship with our wives. I mean, it's seen 
in our relationship with our wives. And if we can't sacrifice our lot, this is what men don't get it. This There's this alpha male mindset. It's like, oh, oh, no, no, that's not my job. Yeah, it is your job. Your job is to mm-hmm. die for her, to be Christ to her. Your job is to sacrifice yourself for your family, and that's a daily thing. And if you can't daily yeah. sacrifice for those little things, you're never going to have. You're going to be too much of a gutless wonder to ever die for your faith. You know, because yeah. you know, because what we've had, totally. we've neutered, we've neutered the stallions. Mm-hmm. You know, the stallions have no. There's no. The geldings have no. There's no fear of death, but there's also not, they're not going to be able to reproduce. Yeah. They're not reproducing, yep. so God wants this. So let's talk about this. We got about 15 minutes left. So you talk about J- Jesus genealogy, but you know, when, how, let's be honest, Ryan. Come on, look at the 12 he chose. I mean, oh my gosh. what the heck is that? I mean, I mean, he chose some of the most random freaking dudes. I, 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 I'm a big fan of the chosen. So in, there's a scene where Jesus calls Levi or Matthew, and Peter goes, "You can't call." Or Peter goes, "You can't call him. He's different." And Jesus mm-hmm. said, "Get used to different." Mm-hmm. And I think that's the key. Why do you think? Jesus chose who he he chose based on your meekness and wild stallion theory. I think he was choosing people who would actually answer the call, right? I, that's why that's why I said earlier it might be a really harsh comment, but not everyone should be Christians. I oh I because, agree with you hundred percent. You know I I think I think you have you have a very select few people that will actually hear the words of Jesus. And they go, yeah, I'll do that. You know what I mean? And I think the the tactic of the enemy is to sanitize and to water it down to the point where it's palatable for the masses. And and here's here's the problem is I speak in all hypocrisy because I'm a content creator, right? So I'm thinking about viral. I'm thinking. And so this is dissonance that's happening in me daily. Um, and the Lord has called me very clearly to spend time with him before I create content. And of, and of course you can be strategic and, and you can like, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to reach a lot of people with the gospel. We want to go to the ends of the earth with this thing. But if that's it, at the expense of the message, that's when you start going wrong because what you're doing is then you're creating a culture that is lukewarm and lukewarm gets spit out. So it's really, really dangerous. I think that's, that's why, um, us leaders, us uh, preachers, so to speak, are held to a higher standard. Absolutely. What do you think about? Here's a, I have a personal opinion. I've been telling. I'm a hunter. I'm not a prophet, so I read signs, and everything to me is pointing to revival. What is your mm. thought about a coming revival in America, and how is that going to plan out if you see that coming as well? Because it looks like well, dark times. Talk- the outside looks very dark. <clears throat> yep. So, what are your thoughts about yeah, that? So. So I've got some I've got some unique thoughts on um, on what I think's what I think's happening. I think there's a lot of people that get messed up in kind of the um, the prophetic uh, fortune telling weirdness. Oh, totally, hundred um, percent. And and trying to see, you know Jesus is coming back here, yeah. you know. But I do actually think that you can look at the Old Testament and you can see what like some of the history and some of the, the thief dates and some of the things that have happened and you can almost foreshadow and look forward. So for example, what are the three main feasts in the old Testament? You have, um, Passover, Mm -hmm. you have Pentecost Mm -hmm. and you have tabernacles. Yes. All right. So what happened with Jesus? Passover lamb was, was slain Mm -hmm. once and for all. What, what happened a couple months later? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came. So you're seeing a shadow. And then what is tabernacle? What does tabernacle mean? That means that God's spirit will fall in a way that is completely different. It's, it's, it's the oneness that gets created where, where it, his spirit is poured out in an extra measure. And so I think the body of Christ right now is stirring. Yes. They're stirring about revival because I think we're, I think we're about to see some tabernacle stuff happening. I think now what that looks like, who knows? Nobody knows, but I think, you know, the, the parable of the virgins is more important than ever where, you know, the 10 Absolutely. virgins were, were called to keep oil in their lamps. And what's the oil? It's intimacy. Mm-hmm. It's nearness to Christ. Um, and that is meekness. That's meekness. It's to say, I am awaiting the bridegroom's return. And we don't know when he's coming back for, but he's coming back for a church that's pure. Oh, for sure. He's coming back for hearts that are pure. And so I think I think we need to we need to prepare ourselves. We need to have oil in our lamps. We need to be awaiting his return with anticipation. I think a lot of the whole left behind stuff has done a lot of harm. Agreed. A lot of fear in his return. 
And um, dude, this is the, the Bible is clear. We should be eagerly awaiting the return of Christ. Do you think the Bible would say eagerly return the like or await the ret- uh, the return of Christ if it was a bad thing? If it was to be feared? No, dude. This is the the comfortable capitalistic uh, sanitized microwave Christianity yep. that has been peddled, and that's it's also the power of media. You look at what Left Behind did; is it it swayed the theology and the eschatology of a whole generation. Um, so it's the importance of what you and I are both doing, but at the same time, mm-hmm. I think this generation needs to be prepared because we're seeing some stuff happen um, that is, is pretty wild. We're seeing nations get reached. That's Absolutely, the thing Jesus said needs to happen. Yep. nations are being reached right yep. now. So it's time to time to uh, keep some tabs on the oil. Well, it's really funny you mentioned the left behind because I'm like I'm reading the books in the '90s and in. Like, you know, this God never makes it easy for Christians or the Jewish people or anybody. So why would it be easy for us now? I'm like, this this isn't working for me. <laughs> you know, because he always mm-hmm. he's always taming the wild stallion. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? He's not just pull, you know, so I agree with you hundred percent. It's it's it seems to me like when I watched your videos, one of the things that really attracted me to what you're doing is you're just unapologetic about it. Mm-hmm. You're saying, I believe this, I believe this to the death. And if you don't like it, tough. If you want to cancel me, great. I don't care. And I, I think mm-hmm. I think God is raising up guys like you who are unapologetic and unwavering. And the message, that's the message, right? And he raised, rose mm-hmm. up these 12 dudes, right? One leaves, they get another one. These guys all are willing to die for their faith. They are willing to die, and 11 out of 12 did die for their faith. And the yeah. one that didn't die was burned, you know, had all sorts of cra- heinous crap happen. But, yeah, yeah. but it's yeah, not yeah. until a man is willing to die every day for what he believes and to not fear cancellation, to not fear uh, what these other voices are going to say. And, you know, Jesus' biggest, uh, I just read today, uh, uh, Jesus' cr- crucifixion. I'm doing the one-year Bible or the uh, blended version of the Bible. And, you know, he was killed by the religious leaders. So when mm. p- people who love Jesus stand up and have a voice, it's probably the church that's going to come after them, sadly. Oh, yeah. The synthetic, oh, watered-down, fog machine church. Shoot, man, who killed Jesus? Well, well you tell the me about leaders. him. 100%. So, so, man, this is good stuff. Well, yeah. hey, man, I this has been super fun for me. I really appreciate what you're doing. So, hey, you got a couple things going on. Do you want to share with them about your digital counseling uh, ministry and also share how yeah. they can reach you on Instagram and your social media stuff? Yeah, yeah. So on, on social media, it's uh, Dude With Good News. Um, and that's on TikTok, uh, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, just short 90-second little devotionals daily. Um, and then my ministry is called share the struggle. So it's a, it's a mental health ministry, um, from a biblical perspective. And so what we do is we give one-on-one support through, um, Christian coaches who are all either, you know, therapists or ICF certified coaches. And we do a really unique model where we're not just going to like do talk therapy, CBT type stuff with you, cognitive behavioral therapy. We're going to pray with you. We're going to do inner healing prayer. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to get really actionable, really practical. Sure, you're going to have a listening ear. You're going to talk through some stuff, but all with the goal of moving forward. That's kind of the the model of our coaching is let's move forward. So you say you're anxious. Okay, well, your screen time's at eight hours a day. Why don't we talk about grayscaling your phone? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you're struggling with your wife right now. Why don't you just go home tonight and do nothing but listen and repeat back to her what you just heard? Things like that, right? So- uh, it's very, very practical and actionable, which I think um, a lot of people are struggling right now, but a lot of people are stuck in habits and they're going and they're ruminating on their past over and over and over again. When the Bible is clear, the only person it says to remember in the New Testament is Lot's wife. And what did she do? Mm-hmm. She looked back yep. on her past. She was looking back with longing and ruminating. She got stuck. She got turned into a pillar of salt. So it's time to move forward. And that's what our ministry is doing. We're seeing God do crazy stuff through it. Like breakthrough is happening um, in people's lives. And so if if you're struggling with, with something, whether it's anxiety or marriage, or you're just looking to grow in your faith, go connect with someone. It, the Bible is very clear. Um, in wise counsel, the victory is won. And so that's that's what we do. And again, it's sharethestruggle.org slash coaching is where you can go. 
And then we've also created the largest video-based mental health platform on the planet. So we have courses on everything from anxiety to miscarriage to uh, trauma, shame, freedom from pornography. We have so many courses and then we have training. Like what do you do when someone's having a panic attack? What do you say when someone has gone through some really hard stuff in their past? What do you say when your, your husband or your wife can't stop looking at porn, you know, whatever. We have all of that training available as well. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty cool. The Lord's, the Lord's taken us on a really uh, awesome journey to help a lot of people. And um, like I was telling you earlier before this podcast, I'm not particularly passionate about mental health more than I am about sharing the gospel for with people. Sure. But I've just found in my own life when I'm struggling the deepest is when the Lord shows up the most. And so I would just tell you listening out there right now, if you're going through some stuff, if you're stuck in an addiction, if you're dealing with some anxiety and some fear, some marital conflict, I think you're primed for breakthrough. Absolutely. I think the Lord is going to show up. That's so good, man. Well, I, I really appreciate your ministry model and, uh, and your message. I just really uh, want to drive our guys over to your stuff. It's dude with good news. And it's also yeah. share the struggles. So check that out, guys. You will be better for it. God bless you, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Hey, guys, if today's podcast has helped you and you're not yet a subscriber to our show, please make sure you head on over there, subscribe. And if you haven't checked out Men in the Arena podcast on YouTube, man, head on over there and check it out. We got some great stuff going on, and you get to see this beautiful face all day long. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game. Get dirty. Grind it out. And be a man.